Good morning to everybody in Zoom land. Welcome back if we've got any repeat faces. I hope everybody's coffeeed up and ready to go, especially me. So <laughs> I want to start with a little, hopefully, inspiration. I'm going to play a little video and we'll talk about it afterwards. But, you know, it's hopefully going to set the tone and put us in a certain mind space and heart space, I hope. <laughs> Habéis derramado vuestra sangre antes que la de un inocente. Esa era la última prueba, la más importante. Y habéis elegido bien, Alteza.
Yeah, if you if anybody saw uh, you know a clip in there that you want to ask about, feel free to put it in the chat or the Q and A. And uh, I did a little bit impose my tastes on you guys, but more than that, I wanted to uh, transport everybody to what I call sort of a non-linear space, a more intuitive mind space and heart space. <clears throat> I thought they were personally kind of surreal and dreamlike, which is really the point I'm trying to make. You may remember, I sh probably should have greeted everybody by saying, welcome back to Word and Image, the language of the soul. Last week, for those of you that might be, um, you know, coming back for more, last week was about catharsis. This week is archetypes and myth in modern storytelling. So, of course, a couple of those clips were from my one of my favorite filmmakers, Guillermo del Toro, who's kind of the guy when it comes to modern myth in cinema. So anyway, I really just hope that would put you in a, a mind space. You probably noticed those were not very reliant on dialogue at all. They were image, <clears throat> score, production. I mean, they happen to have been beautifully production designed. That's not the reason I compiled them. But yeah, beautiful production design. But I think the point really is that we, the reason I named the workshop the language of dreams is when you think about it, pre-written language, <clears throat> excuse me, pre-language, even the incessant voice in our head that won't shut up, we call that reverie. It didn't always take the form of words, right? So pre-language, I would argue, images were the way we dreamt. So our subconscious still delivered the needed information for our survival. And there's, we'll get into dreams in a little bit, but you know, there's many schools of thought on their function. But I would argue that we dreamt in dreams and that is largely the reason they became sort of expressed in our storytelling. And um, it's the reason the archetypes evolved in the first place. Okay, so hope that um, worked for you. But now I wanna sort of go into a little exercise. And if anybody's out there, I don't know who's in Zoom land, but if we have anyone participating, uh, humor me and we're gonna do a little exercise. I do this at the outside of, outset of uh, both. I have many classes that have run at Art Center, but the background class and the Viz Dev class have run for 20 years. So I've done this one, not for the full 20, but I would say for about 15 to 12 to 15 years in the visual development class, certainly, because in that class, obviously everything we're talking about in this lecture series is really important when illuminating an intellectual property and bringing it to life. So I've done this for many, many terms, many years in the business class, and it will serve, a, a, I think, a valuable purpose here today. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you a list, I think of 10 Im images, I call them uh, percepts. So something you can see, touch, smell, taste, and then you're gonna think about the related concept. So don't think about it too much, but um, think of what it just might symbolize, whether in media or storytelling or religion or pop culture, doesn't matter, don't think too much, but just quickly write what you think it could symbolize universally and then um, I don't want word association. So if I say cat, please don't say hat. <laughs> Put a little thought into it, just not too much. What it might symbolize. Okay, and I'm gonna read the whole list. Please, if you have a pen and paper, I know that's sort of an archaic concept, or if you can take a quick note on notepad, I would write down your responses in advance. I'm gonna get through the whole list and we'll number them. And then for participation, when we go back, then I'd like you to put them in the chat. When I mention number one, I'm gonna prompt you to put them in the chat. I hope this works. Uh, this is just to make a point and get, again, set the tone, but I don't want it to take the whole 90 minutes. So let's see how this goes. The first- Yeah, they said that they're ready, so- um, Enough explaining? Okay. Yeah, no, it's fine. Let's go. <laughs> I'm taking our valuable time explaining why we shouldn't spend time on this. Anyway, here's the entire list and please number them, but don't put them in the chat yet. <clears throat> okay, tree, number one. Tree, T-R-E-E. -E. Number two is cliff. Number three is bridge. And if you didn't understand me, I just don't want to spell them all. I do that sometimes. If you didn't catch one, ask me. Number four is horizon. Number five is red, the color red. Uh, 
Number six is snake. The animal. Number seven is eagle. <clears throat> number, number whatever, eight is black. Number nine is circle. I'm gonna play two, by the way. And thank you if you're participating, I really appreciate it. And number 10, finally, is triangle or pyramid. Okay, I certainly have responses that are, you know, the consensus from term to term in my classes. And then of course, it's hard to remember what I would have said originally before doing this for 12 to 15 years. But I do have the consensus on the tip of my tongue from class. If there were any responses, Tina, I would rather involve the group or chime in yourself if you would. Um, but do we have anything for tree yet? I don't think we asked them for it. So well, if tree we was wanna... number one. Okay, great. We didn't. We asked them not oh. to put it in the chat yet, but right if... now we're doing. Now we're. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, now we're doing it. So see if anything comes up for tree. Please put it in the chat. What their concept is, or what the first thing right. that comes to mind for tree. Right. What tree might symbolize. Yeah, oh, they great. Were to, I guess I didn't explain it too well. They were supposed to be jotting it down as I said them. Right. But now, they, if you have a they... response, put it in the chat. Okay, great. So uh, Lily put life, Nettles put growth, Grace put growth, David put growth. And I'm sorry if I'm butchering people's names, but Juwili Ju put family. Mm, yes, exactly. Thank you. I mean, you'll see the point. It's not that we're all predictable. Don't worry. It's not about how original or unoriginal we are. That was exactly the consensus I usually get. I think you said them all. Growth, life, um, family. Family. Someone just put knowledge. Love. Oh, yes. The tree of knowledge, the family tree, all of that. Thank you. I mean, enough said. I don't want to spend time on that, but um, though That's awesome. there might be one other. I think transformation comes up sometimes or renewal. Right, uh, hope, hope springs eternal renewal, that sort of thing. After the barren winter, when the roots grow deeper. Anything else, Tina? Uh, no, that's what they that's put there. That's perfect. great. And I can't believe that worked and so quickly. Uh -huh. Oh, there is one. A latecomer just came in. Wisdom. Exactly. Oh, great stuff. Thank you, guys. Number two is Cliff. Anything for Cliff? Go ahead and put it in now. All right, they're coming in. I can say mine. Yeah, maybe I will. No, because they've already hopefully written down their responses and I won't steal from their ideas. I usually <laughs> quickly, yeah, it'll just give more time for them to put them in. So I often hear um, peril, danger, and then sometimes like adventure. What they've put in is Milka put in danger. Krister put in danger. Juili put in choices. Yes, love that. Mm -hmm. Lily said hard decision. John Pattison says fall. And Grace says danger. John, did you mean like ouchie? John. <laughs> fall, ouchie. <laughs> I got it. Anyway, uh, per perfection. Um, you hit all the usual suspects as I confirmed. He's, John said yes. <laughs> <laughs> ouchie. Um, Number three, let's go ahead and put in our responses for bridge, if you have any. And again, the ones I usually hear are connection, strength, and integrity, kind of on an engineering level. It is the strongest thing you could build. So we hear strength a lot. Other archetype, hint, hint, other than strength is connection, passage. Somebody said choices a moment ago. That comes up for bridge quite a bit. Any, anything? Yeah, Milka says hope. Grace says connection. John says connect. Christer says transition. Julie yeah. says connection. Ruben says transition. And Lily said, oh, Lily just mentioned that she was agreeing. Okay, perfect. All right. Number, we're going to speed it up a little bit. Number four is horizon. If you could put that in the chat. I often hear, in my opinion, actually, is it, it represents the future or destiny or fate, maybe possibility. Sometimes advent, did I say adventure? There might be others that I'm not remembering. Um, anything else? Anything come in yet? 
Yeah, Grace says opportunity. John says future. Lily says hope. And Ruben says travel. Mm, love it. <clears throat> Number five, I believe, is red, the color red. I often Ooh, hear, the color red. It's a it's not a lazy color, it's very active, right? So all the responses are pretty charged. But you yeah, hear, yeah, you hear conflict, blood, family, actually. Um, conflict, aggression, war, battle, blood, things like that. Oh, communism sometimes. Yeah, they they mentioned uh, Milka mentioned strawberry. Ruben says passion. She's hungry. That's why she's hungry. <laughs> Grace <laughs> says passion. Yes. Passion. Metal says love and danger. Lily mentions important, and Gwilly okay. says passion. Love it. I can't. I don't think I said passion. I think I said love, but of course passion. Yeah. Okay. Somebody and just came in and said action. Love it. And I'm sure you're speculating about the point I'm making and also why this might be. And I'm sure you've thought of it many times, but there might be more to it than you think at first glance. I mean, simply put, you put someone in a red room, right? Their physiology reacts. So their pulse rate, their breathing rate, um, the whole limbic system, it all reacts. And it's, it does go back to the cortisol and the um, adrenaline that we spoke of last week. So the neural transmitters and the peptides and all of that are affected. So the physio physiological state is affected. As we know, there's more to it than that. Red has cultural relativity, right? Cultural associations. But today we're talking about what underlies all of that, what might be universal despite cultural re relativity. And it is related, believe it or not, to the physiological response, but there's a reason it gets mapped on your worldview or your values. And that does go back to what we covered last week. There's gonna be a little overlap today, but I don't wanna do literal repeat of information. This is sort of supplementing what we spoke about last week. So the next one, I think it's six or seven. Yeah, then six is snake. Anything, anything? Snake, all right, let's wait a minute. Yeah, I'll-, oh, I'll yeah. Here I sometimes come. hear um, temptation, evil, deception, and then actually renewal or life in some cultures, but I don't oh, know. Interesting. Ever, yeah. Yeah. Ruben says deception. John says bite. Melka Ouch. says Ouchy, be. John. <laughs> Milka says be aware. Mm, yes. Warning. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Gully says focus. Krister danger. Mm -hmm. Grace trickery. Lily mm. treason. Uh, Gulika resurrection. Well, see, that's a bit, a little bit like the renewal one I mentioned. Who was that last person? Gulika D. Gulika says resurrection. Right. I I would ask if she feels like it. Um, tell me if that's where she gets that. Is that a cultural reference? Because I just learned, actually, as you know, my novel. I, some of you know, uh, The Seeker is based in Bronze Age Minoan culture, Minos, Crete, and I'm learning. Of course, it predates Greek classicism. And a lot of uh, the sort of tropes in Greek classicism came out of Minoan religion, not just Minoan folklore, but it was a religion. So I actually just learned in that culture, snake meant rebirth, renewal. Yeah, As, she said uh, shedding of the skin. Uh, she right, said it's exactly. kind of like rebirth, a new chance maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sure it exists in many cultures. It was new to me. I didn't know the Minoans. Uh, saw it that way. I think we have a, in Judeo-Christian Western European culture, we have a definitely a negative uh, association or connotation. Okay, number whatever, seven is eagle. This is always an interesting loaded one. Uh, yeah, eagle. eagle. Waiting uh -oh. for somebody to comment. Yeah, just in the interest of time, I think it's fascinating because again, you have really diverse associations with it. You hear freedom, you hear freedom, strength, even liberty, things like that for obvious reasons. But then on the flip side, you hear predatory, talons. Oh, interesting. Well, it is interesting when you think, oh, well, we use that and so did the Nazis. So think about that. Well, Gui Lee says nobility. Milka mm -hmm. says mystery. Lily says uh, Murica uh, slash freedom. Right. Freedom. Christer says sharpness. Mm -hmm. Ruben, sovereign. Grace says loyalty, Net Nettles says flight, and Gulika says determination. Love it, wow, thanks. See how it was kind of all over the place, a little more than some of the others? 
Um, yeah. But you do hear, it does gravitate towards strength and freedom and then the more predatory archetype. Um, the next one, yeah, number eight is black. Black. Uh -huh. And I, I'll say the obvious and then you can tell me what they said. You hear death, mystery, nothingness, um, pretty negative usually, but death, nothingness or um, mystery, danger. Mm. Yeah, Ruben says power. Gwilly says void. Oh, I meant, yes, authority. Sorry. Ah, authority, power. Uh, Christa says nothingness, emptiness. John mentions darkness. Grace says mysterious. Mm. Oh. Lily says somber. Mm. And Milka says hiding in comfort. Oh, I love that. Is that a goth, maybe a goth participant? Mm. That word is every generation, right? We have some version of goth. But I did, it just hit like funerals, we were black. So nobody said mourning, but I think some of them bordered on that kind of mourning idea. Uh, number nine, I believe. Yeah, you're <laughs> right. Nobody said death. <laughs> yeah, well, you're right. They said nothingness, I think. Ah, uh, okay. Which some people equate death with nothingness. I hate to think of it that way. But yes, authority is a big one. Just a Bowie story really quick. I, he, he is such a mellow dog, but I was at the soup, in front of the supermarket and something about security guards in dark uniforms. <gasps> he didn't nip at this guy, but he, he kind of charged. He almost lunged. So uh, it's interesting that something about a black uniform is very intimidating, even to Bowie. Anyway, I digress. Amazing. <laughs> um, and it could be associations, of course, that he had with you know past experiences. But Absolutely. I don't know. Like, we're going to talk about innately, not to dogs so much, but to us, why we might actually have what I call innate responses to formal properties. So let's do the final one and then I'll explain what the hell that meant. Uh, number 10 is triangle or pyramid. So again, I'll give mine first. Uh, in addition to the obvious, uh, aliens and Egyptians, you hear strength, power, awe-inspiring, hierarchy, institution, things like that. Yeah, they're answering. Grace says sharp. Mm -hmm. And oh, then Gwilly okay. says hierarchy. Mm -hmm. Milka mentions dynamism. Uh, Ruben says dynasty too, a lot, by the way. Dynasty. Structure, Illuminati. <laughs> David says grounded. Illuminati, as in it's on our money. Yep. <laughs> For the conspiracy theorists among us. Right. Grounded. I like that. Did you say grounded? David said grounded. Yeah, that's interesting because, again, we talked about on an engineering level why bridge represents strength and integrity. Well, a, a pyramid can't be toppled, right? It literally right. cannot be toppled. So it is one of the strongest things you can build. But there's a reason the pyramidal composition dominated uh, composition for much of the Renaissance, because it does have that awe-inspiring, captivating effect. And it does go back to something on a fundamental level, understands the solidity and the security of that. In composition, you've heard of this idea of balance. If you have 50-50 yin and yang or dark and light or positive and negative space, it is what's called static. You don't get dendrite movement. You, and they can now, there's gestalt studies, of course, but there's now um, studies that can track the eyeball. Where do you enter the composition? How do you circulate? Where is the focal point where you spend the majority of your time? Do you then exit or do you continue to circulate? We can prove what we've been doing for 500 years now. But um, I think we all know this idea of balance just so you don't fall out of the composition, right? It's, if you fall out and never return, it's all over. So especially in film, right? Where you wanna create a convincing universe that seems to exist beyond the screen you just don't want people exiting or having awkward tangencies that draw the eye away from the action or the focal point, right? So we do desire a degree of balance, even if the emotional tone of a scene is imbalance, literally, like you want everything to feel a little, um, like the elite equilibrium is off or something ain't quite right. Even if that's your goal, we still desire a degree of balance. So I hope that makes sense. There are very, our equilibrium, which is very survival based, demands that. And so we're getting to the root of maybe what these innate responses we have are based in. 
So uh, well, a little more on that in just a minute. Thank you so much for participating. That could not have gone better. That went great. Uh, thank you, Tina, for fielding them. All right, so hopefully it should be clear, not that we're all highly unoriginal, but that there is an inherent symbology to life. Life imitates art. That is a big premise of this workshop. But put another way, there's a shared language beyond words, which I referenced a moment ago, suggesting that our dreams were the language of the soul and pre-language, that is how we spoke to our subconscious for sure. And then if you believe in a collective unconscious, if you believe in collective consciousness, that is also how um, non-locally we receive information. All right, so notice the last latter ones on the list were just shapes or colors. They weren't, oh, sheep we should have done. You hear, for example, two vastly different archetypes like follower, conformity, and then um, sacrifice, right? Like a sacrificial lamb, you hear all variations on sacrifice. And then my students at Art Center are often um, hungry because, you know, starving students. So you hear tasty or sheep a lot. Um, so you, <laughs> there's a lot of cultural relativity, of course. My students at Art Center are largely international students more and more every day. And of course, a lot of them are Korean for whatever reason, They're, that's where the money's coming from right now in, in our economy. So you can have a lot of East, Eastern Asian students, and even with that dichotomy of East and West, it's amazing how universal this stuff is. It is not necessarily Judeo-Christian or Western European in nature. Now you can speculate, and I'm sure you have opinions for yourself, exactly why there's shared territory. Um, in animation alone, and I'm guessing most of us are animation artists, uh, we all know that we've been sharing with anime since Speed Racer days and Godzilla days, right? So let's say Disney, for good or bad, created a pipeline that became the norm at Disney, DreamWorks, PDI, Pixar, again, for good or bad. I'm not saying it's necessarily a good thing, but it became all the conventions and traditions and even the pipeline itself became the norm for a long, long time. So again, you see in Speed Racer days, Disney even borrowed from anime. Think of the Little Mermaid days, they call it the Renaissance of animation. And that's when I stepped on board. You saw those anime eyes on Ariel. You saw them on, you know, Aladdin. So I do think, you know, there is what's called the social conditioning aspect to this, right? Some of the tropes are perpetuated through images we're exposed to during our lifetime, and they may not be encoded in our DNA, but some of them are, I'm gently suggesting. I have a quick question. Uh, somebody just mentioned we skipped circle. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, okay, I Do don't want to. Do you want to? Um, yeah, sure. Why not? Through? Yeah, if you want to share those, I you hear perfection, completion, non-threatening, maternal. You hear, um, and thank you for that. I'm glad we didn't skip that one. Yeah, somebody in the chat mentioned that. Wholeness, holism. You hear a lot of that. Let's say Ruben is saying unity. Grace mm -hmm. says friendly. And Gwili says repetition. Yep, honest, awesome. I'm glad you brought that up because that is going to come up later, actually. Uh, somebody said Earth. Love it. So a circle is the ultimate in a curvilinear shape, right? We're going to talk about angular and curvilinear a bit later. Does anybody ever think safe? On that on that shape? On circle? Um, I, I'm sure I've heard that, yeah. Hmm. I mean, it is safe. You could drop... I mean, you could drop a bowling ball on your foot, right? Uh, yeah. But within reason. Um, it's just no sharp edges. That's why it right, came right, to my right. mind. Yeah. Right. No, that's what we're going to get to is, I guess it's a good time now. Again, if you look at, and we're going to define archetype in just a moment. But if you are from the mindset, and it's not good, bad, right, or wrong, but if you think Young, who coined archetypes or popularized them anyway, is just full of shit, right? And there is no collective unconscious passed on through DNA that animals have instinct, but we humans are way above that. We don't have instinct. And I'm being a little facetious, but that's a, an staunchly empiricist materialist view. And actually it's the norm now because of education. So with my students, it's fascinating in 20 years to see the shift in education because they're coming from high school, right? How they no longer can speak of archetypes. Young is a quack, Freud is a quack. It's that cancel culture thing, right? So now it's much more politically correct to speak of tropes. Tropes, 
perpetuated through social conditioning. I'm offering that it doesn't really matter what you believe, but surely we would all agree this is the language we're speaking as visual storytellers, especially visual development artists, might as well get to know the vocabulary and call them what you want, but let's go to those basic character archetypes. Let's go to these innate responses we have to certain formal properties. And in this case, shapes, colors, all the things in your design soup, all the ingredients in your design soup. So on that one, Tina, the bowling ball, their circle being feeling safe, we would all agree. Angles, put angles on your villain because they represent threat and menace subconsciously, right? And then put curvilinear forms to denote beauty. So certainly on the female protagonist, right? And or anything that's non-threatening, maternal, nurturing. It's a no-brainer in character design. But the why part of that equation is another story. So I gently offer, again, if you're an empiricist and a materialist, I'll give you some grist for the mill. A developmental psychologist called Piaget uh, posits that there's a stage in development where children generalize experiences. So a child doesn't need to prick his or her finger on a knife, a shard of glass, an icicle, a tooth, to know that triangles represent danger or sharp objects, right? It's a generalizing function of the brain. And curvilinear, the opposite. Maybe mothers feel, you know what I mean? We associate it with curves. I don't want to go too far down that road, but I think you get the idea. But you could drop a bowling ball on your foot and it wouldn't be safe. I'm just throwing that out there. And someone had a quick question. Were some of the clips shown earlier from foreign films? Um, well, Guillermo del Toro does films that end up being internationally successful, but I believe he is, oh, I don't want to say the wrong thing. I don't know, but yeah, of course there were. Um, the Bjork, if you know Bjork, Dancer in the Dark, that's Lars von Trier, Guillermo, de, Guillermo Lola del Toro, City of Lost Children, or La Cité des Enfants Perdus is Genet and Caro. I did want to put a little bow on that former conversation, though, by hearkening back to last week. And I'm going to hopefully say it clearer than last week, because it's going to tie all of this together. Do you remember we spoke about this mapping, this encoding on the brain? So every stimulus that you encounter during your day either represents a threat or an opportunity on a survival level, right? If you're an evolutionary theorist, Everything, every stimulus, a rustling bush, a woman you see walking down the sidewalk that you find attractive, whatever it is, gets either categorized quick, very quickly subconsciously as a threat or an opportunity or neither, in which case it gets sort of relegated to the subconscious and falls by the wayside. Those things that your brain decides are important enough to encode on the worldview, if you wanna word it that way, or on your value system, are those things that were threats or opportunities because of the heightened emotion attached to them, right? So that rustling in the bush might suddenly put you in fire flight mode and the cortisol's flowing and the adrenaline's flowing, that will be mapped and you have an association there. So the next time a bush rustles, right? You either have this knee jerk reaction to it. And we said last week, you sometimes rationalize later and use the intellect to temper that, but I hope you followed all that. That which gets encoded on your brain are, sorry, now I'm not using English, but are the, the threats or opportunities that the brain decides are worth encoding because of the heightened emotion. Do you see how that's exactly why we strive to make filmmaking and cinema an emotional experience? That's exactly why, as is the uh, premise of this entire workshop, we learn, grow, and transform mostly through storytelling. Not in the didactic realm through persuasion, but we are product of the stories we've been exposed to. I hope it's all coming together. I don't love to talk about the brain science behind it because it's pretty dry, but it, it's really what's, and as we said last week, you know, propaganda is fraught with this kind of analysis. Advertising, they're banking on it, and it seems rather manipulative, doesn't it? I would rather you study it, then let it go, let it be second nature, and just follow inspiration. We're going to talk about that a little bit. Originality has come up a lot lately, and we're going to get to that in just a minute. 
hope some of that makes sense. So Amazing. yeah, just, thank you. Oh, of course. I hope um, to recap. I think we illustrated that there is something universal. We can have our own ideas about it. You know, why we have innate responses? Is it nature or nurture? Again, I don't really care what you believe, but I think you would agree this is the language we're speaking in cinema and as visual storytellers. Let's check out the vocabulary. Okay, so let's define archetype. Why not go back to square one? So again, I'm doing what you're not supposed to do. Just call me a high school valedictorian, but I'm gonna share a dictionary definition. Right, so the dictionary, dictionary definitions of archetype are in behavior, psychology, and I know you can read, but it's worth going over this as a group. In behavior, historical psychology, and literary analysis. A statement, pattern of behavior, prototype, first form, or main model that other statements, patterns of behavior, and objects copy, emulate, or merge into. Really interesting wording. <clears throat> the platonic concept of pure form, and platonic not meaning a type of friendship, but meaning Plato's concept of pure form, believed to embody the fundamental characteristics of a thing. Now, that's another example, in just my opinion, of how we innately were wired for an understanding of uh, metaphysics and also the physical realm. So even though there was a limited understanding of DNA, the role of DNA at that time, his forms are basically, right, DNA. He's also tapping into something about abstractions are the only thing that remain ultimately true in the flux of life in the physical realm, meaning time and circumstances mean that nothing is absolutely true. You can disprove anything using the Socratic method, right? Anything definitive you can say can be disproven because of the insufficiencies of language alone. The only thing that remains true are abstractions. One and one will always equal two, right? Two and two will always equal four. So in that way, the perceptual realm is more constant. That, sorry if I said it wrong. The conceptual realm is more constant than the perceptual realm. Um, I don't want to lose you. Uh, but anyway, the next definition is a collectively inherited unconscious idea, pattern of thought, image, etc., that is universally present in individual psyches, as in Jungian's, Jungian psychology. A constantly recurring symbol or motif in literature, painting, or mythology. This definition refers to the recurrence of characters or ideas sharing similar traits through various seemingly unrelated cases in classic storytelling, media, etc. This usage of the term draws from both comparative anthropology. We talked a lot about Joseph Campbell last week, who's a comparative religion expert, and from Jungian archetypal theory. Finally, speeding up, archetypes are also very close analogies to instincts, as I suggested a moment ago, in that long before any consciousness develops, it is, Im it is the impersonal, and I think they mean universal, not subjective, and inherited traits of human beings that represent and motivate human behavior. All right, now to the original Jungian definition. Those are the dictionary definitions. So Jung, and I think it's interesting because surely you know Socrates never wrote anything down, right? That everything we understand about his philosophies comes from his predecessors or his uh, sort of um, protégés, right? So it's kind of the same with Jung. He did write books, he did write essays, but he wrote them in prose form, not list form, right? So only Jungian analysts later compiled these hardcore lists and you'll see, I'm gonna show you slides, everybody's interpretation of Jung's theories is different. They add their proprietary spin, and then it does evolve, of course. Modern storytelling creates subcategories to the main character archetypes. So more in a minute, but it is important to look at what Jung was actually saying. So his definition, I'm sorry, a definition that's most closely related to his writings is universal primal symbols and images that derive from the collective unconscious as proposed by Carl Jung. They are the psychic counterpart of instinct. The etymology is first molded. I actually have heard first form more often than first molded. And it's from arc, meaning the beginning, origin, or first place, and typos, the model type blow or mark of a blow, as in type. Of course, type back then was a chisel and a tablet. 
you get the idea. But first form is the one that clicks for me. The collective unconscious, which right occurred in the previous definition, the unconscious mind and shared mental concepts is generally associated with idealism as opposed to materialism, by the way, and was coined by Carl Jung. According to Jung, the human collective unconscious is populated by instincts as well as archetypes. Please just check it out on your own. Obviously, there's not enough time here today to go into every single character archetype. We're going to touch on them, but I do think it's worth exploring on your own. And then I do it on a case by case basis. So as you know, like we said, everything's culturally relative. There's a regional symbology in every folktale myth legend. And that is overwhelming. Again, just focusing on Bronze Age Minoan culture, there's a whole world to explore there. So I'm fascinated by it, but of course I just do it myself on an as needed basis. So again, there will be supplemental reading and maybe that'll, you know, catch your interest and prompt you. Here quickly, when I spoke of all the proprietary spin-offs of, Young, of Young's original, not even lists, but original concepts of character archetypes, I do like this one, so it's worth sharing because they're opposites. So the ego and the shadow. Last week, we talked about Thomas More, who wrote a book, I think, called Embracing the Shadow. So there are a whole list, there is a whole list of just shadow archetypes. The great mother, tyrannical father, the wise old man, in a moment we're going to call that the oracle or the sage or the voice of wisdom, versus the trickster, animus and anima. I believe I might get this wrong, but I think animus is the male aspect of a female psyche and vice versa. Meaning and absurdity, centrality and diffusion, order and chaos. Do you see already how these are automatically become thematic content, if nothing else? If not a hardcore archetypal story template, these become certainly thematic content. Opposition to conjunction, time to eternity. Love that one. That's the flux and permanence we spoke about a moment ago, as is transformation. And I hate that word they chose, but fixity, that's the equivalent of flux and transformation. And then we have sacred and profane. That means a lot to me these days, sacred and profane. And again, becomes thematic content in most literature on some level. And then you have light and darkness. All right. Now, again, if you lean toward the other, hope you're, hopefully you're following. If not, these will be archived and you can rewind. But if you lean a little bit more toward the materialist or empiricist stance that it's all social conditioning, nothing is ingrained in us or hardwired, There's, then we're going to talk about tropes. How are they passed on during one's lifetime via exposure? I do want to say there is plenty of evidence that this stuff is encoded in our genes. We went over some of it today but I also want you to look into epigenetics. We pass on, right, what we've done with our DNA, which is just the blueprint, right? If you think of the DNA as just the blueprint, every single gene on your DNA strand is self-created all day, every day. Proteins are being created, cells create themselves all day, every day. Modern epigenetics says that even things like a tendency toward depression or a chemical imbalance, a tendency towards chronic anxiety, all of these things are encoded on your DNA. They're malleable within your lifetime. And there's something called a methyl group that controls the expression of a gene or the squelching of a gene. We create those methyl groups all day, every day with our lifestyle choices, our diets, hint, hint, the movies we expose ourselves to and we're constantly crafting our DNA and what's encoded on it. At the moment of conception, that's what's passed on to our children. So do you see the possibilities? If we start shifting our paradigms collectively, I think the possibilities are endless. I jokingly say, you know, I don't know that we'll learn to regenerate an arm like a starfish, but it's possible. <laughs> it's not out of the realm of possibility. <laughs> One day. We sent a rocket into space, come on. Okay, so I agree. Trope, well, well, thank you, Tina. <laughs> um, but a trope, if you're leaning toward the more, you know, hardcore, something you, uh, I guess, uh, quantifiable that science has already proven, right? So we thought the earth was flat. Of course, there's a hell of a lot we don't understand about the universe. 
and quantum mechanics is getting to the bottom of things, but there's plenty of things we'll never understand. So I, I do like to go back to things that we can already understand with science. Sorry. Okay, a trope, according to Wiki, in cinema, a trope is what the art direction handbook for film defines as a universally identified image imbued with several layers of contextual meaning, creating a new visual metaphor. You may recall we defined resonance last week, right? So archetypes lend resonance. When those archetypes recur in mythology and storytelling and art over decades, more and more resonance is added. Uh, in literature, Wiki says, a literary trope is the use of figurative language via word, phrase, or an image for artistic effect, such as using a figure of speech. The word trope has also come to be used for describing commonly recurring literary and rhetorical devices, motifs, or cliches in creative works. There's a lot there. <laughs> and I do not expect, unless you're a writer, expect you to really remember what a rhetorical device is versus just a literary device. But I know I learned it in high school, if not junior high, it, it's in there somewhere, but it's not necessary to get to the bottom of that paragraph. I will give you one example of a literary device. Uh, pathetic fallacy, because it's big in Shakespeare, actually, pathetic, in which is one of our main templates. Pathetic fallacy is using a storm to echo a character's melancholy, for example. Or we, we mentioned horizon earlier, right? The future, the impending. So a coming storm on the horizon might symbolize impending war, okay? Some in definitions of pathetic fallacy flop it and say it's the opposite. It's when we personify a natural element, like the wistful wind or the melancholy rain. Hopefully you get the idea, one example. And I think now might be a good moment to say, you know, we just described what, what gets encoded on our worldview. I hope you made the connection that the heightened emotional experiences are what gets encoded. This is A, why we learn through metaphor, right? But it's also why we learn through conflict resolution, which we agreed is inherent in storytelling. It's an innate part of the drive to tell stories. I'm speaking a little fast because I want to get to some slides. Okay, enough on that. Um, so here are the original Jungian archetypes. There are many more lists, hint, hint, um, that people have spun it off into, which we do not have time to go over, but I am gently suggesting learn about them on your own. I'm going to give you a few names of Jungian analysts who have taken it further. There are two right there, Margaret uh, Hartwell and Joshua Chen. But here are the basic umbrella types the innocent, the orphan or regular guy or gal, the hero, the caregiver, the soul types include the explorer, the rebel, the lover, the creator, the self types include the jester, the sage, the magician, and the ruler. Before moving forward, I wanna gently suggest that we have all of this in us, right? A great actor can draw on all of these types. Have you ever taken a test like a personality profile? Are you type A or are you type B? And you feel like, well, or even a horoscope that just through the power of suggestion and, and suggestibility, you think, oh yeah, of course, I'm gonna have a bad day today because Mercury's in retrograde, right? So I think the whole, hu whole of human experience is accessible to us. So I do think we are all combinations of these archetypes. I also think a dimensional character can be a mixed bag of these archetypes. Think about that. And they do overlap, and we'll, we're going to have some examples of that. It is said that a great novel is actually a portrait of that author's psyche at a given moment in time. How could it not be? Who else's world experience is an author going to draw on? So Emily Bronte, as we, I think, said, largely wrote Wuthering Heights without having really left the house. So she didn't have the life experience to sort of confirm her hunches or her intuition. I guarantee you she was drawing on some kind of collective unconscious in that case. And there are many cases. I happen to love garage bands that are raw with no training or singer songwriters that are very raw with no training for that reason alone. They're drawing on something without technique, but more importantly, maybe without much exposure. All right, so that's just an example of how, how very many families of archetypes have evolved out of Jung's original concepts. 
All right, but let's get specific. Here we have the first one that we mentioned, the innocent. So this is Ophelia from Hamlet. If you know that story, she was sort of martyred and many of the innocents end up being martyrs. She was sacrificed to patriarchy, simply put. And this is one of my favorite painters. This is Millet's beautiful painting of Ophelia. This is another favorite painter, Waterhouse. This is his depiction of Ophelia. Uh, if you ever saw Cruel Intentions, an amazing film, uh, Madame de Tourville, hold on. Yeah, Madame de Tourville from Dangerous, Dangerous Liaisons is a, an archetypal quintessential innocent. And that's John Malkovich uh, sidling up on her. Uh, and then this was the horrible teen version of Dangerous Liaisons that I think it was late 90s or mid 90s that came out. And uh, it was supposed to be for my generation, although these people are a little younger than me. I think I was already in college when it came out. But that, that's the horrible high school version of Dangerous Liaisons that certainly paved the way for um, Gossip Girl, which I did like. This is Olivia de Havilland's Melanie from Gone with the Wind. And she's a great character because she's all virtue. She's kindness and grace, but more importantly, all virtue. And it is her fatal flaw, actually. And then you have the Babe in the Woods version of The Innocent, which would be Brad and Janet from Rocky Horror Picture Show, <laughs> who get in a little too deep and have a huge learning curve, as evidenced by this one. <laughs> and then I, I want to quickly say, you know, in my teaching, I've noticed when there's a passive narrator, like in Cabaret here, and a few more examples I'm going to show, sometimes it's hard to parse, is that the protagonist or not? Who has the big character arc? Who has the transformation? So I've noticed students, or probably all of us, sometimes mistake the narrator for the protagonist. There was a time when this passive narrator, kind of just watching events unfold like a wallflower, was a, a, a convention. So it's certainly the case with Cabaret, another film I highly recommend. So in the play, it was Clifford Bradshaw, but in the film version, for whatever reason, it was Brian. That's also Cabaret. And I'm going to stop for one second just to say, you know, yeah, I'm not necessarily imposing my tastes. I just found the logical examples. There are a million more. Please put in the chat if you can think of, as we get to different archetypes, if you can think of the perfect example, please put it in the chat. And then afterwards, we're going to break to, hopefully, if there's time, a little Q&A and going over some of the chat. But I guess I feel compelled to say, as visual development artists, we all need to play catch up, right? I used to say, you know, go to Blockbuster Video, play catch up. I can't say that in, anymore, obviously. There's one Blockbuster left, by the way, and it's in Bend, Oregon, near my godson's house. But now, of course, with all these different streaming opportunities and distribution avenues, there's no excuse. So I think you should play catch up. I think we all should play catch up know that animation evolved neck and neck with live action. It came a bit later, believe it or not. So it borrowed film language, cinematography, a number of conventions from live action, but they also evolved neck and neck. So every book you could pick up on filmmaking will say, oh, you must see From Here to Eternity. You must see The Manchurian Candidate. You name it. Every book is different about you know, on the front of like which films were pivotal in film history or groundbreaking or worth seeing. You may look at a couple books and just pick the ones that recur. But I think no matter what you're watching, it's going to be good for you. You know, I think if you look at The Incredibles, for example, there were clear cut sequences where they were paying homage to film noir. Sky Captain, same thing. They paid homage to different genres of film. And the joke is lost a little bit if, if you don't, you know, brush up on your film noir. So anyway, the, some of these titles in here are worth checking out if you have time. Someone so, in the chat highly recommended, sorry to interrupt, uh, a subscription to criterionchannel.com. Yeah, there's so many distribution. I mean, I'm not going to pretend I know. I'm kind of a Netflix guy these days. <laughs> but yes, I support all that. Thank you for that. And back to the passive narrator idea. Again, Clifford Bradshaw from Cabaret. Uh, this is actually um, Nick Carraway from The Great Gatsby. Any version of it. This happens to be the Robert Redford one. 
I don't think they've ever done Great Gatsby right. Far be it for me to have an opinion, but don't think it's been done right. Amazing book. This one was a little cheesy, even with Robert Redford. But this is Sam Waterston as Nick Carraway. And then I don't know if you guys saw the Leo DiCaprio version of The Great Gatsby. I love Baz Luhrmann and I love musical, you know, movie musicals, but did not love this. Despite Tobey Maguire, he can do no wrong in my eyes. But this is Tobey Maguire playing Nick Carraway. Yet again, an innocent, a babe in the woods, a deer in the headlights with a huge, uh, even though he's a passive narrator, he does have a learning curve. All right, and then Stingo and Sophie's Choice. If you have not seen that one, I demand that you see it for many reasons. Uh, Meryl Streep is a goddess. I think we can agree to that. But more importantly, it has probably, it's regularly voted one of the top five or whatever, 10 tear jerkers of all time. So if you guys have seen Terms of Endearment, I won't give any spoilers, but there's a pretty hard to watch goodbye scene in the hospital. And right up there with it is this scene from Sophie's Choice. So I think you should see it for this scene alone. All right, and then finally, you saw this in the montage that we started out with, Dancer in the Dark by Lars von Trier. And then of course, Bjork. I've learned it's not Bjork, it's Bjork played the classic innocent. This is, and actually the martyred innocent, Dancer in the Dark. All right, and then this one, I'm sure you've hopefully seen The Devil Wears Prada. This is a, I think of like six years ago now, who knows, maybe 10. God, somebody tell me how long ago was this? I have no sense of time anymore. Anyway, this is again, the classic babe in the woods or, or deer in the headlights, call it what you want, trying to swim with sharks and actually trying to retain their innocence and not betray themselves in doing so. So that is an archetypal story template, preservation of innocence, return to innocence, and it became a Shakespearean template as well. So hopefully you're also seeing, they do evolve with modern storytelling, but man, humans don't evolve much. So what, what was really prescient about the human condition I would say certainly during Greek classicism when the tragedies were perfected by Aristotle, but also the Shakespearean templates, but some would go so far as to say even back to uh, oral tradition around the campfire. One of Guillermo del Toro's quotes that we, I think, read last week, he very much said even the horror movie dates back to oral tradition around the campfire when you just scared the crap out of your children with stories of boogeymen, A, so they wouldn't mis misbehave, but also so they wouldn't wander away into the darkness and, you know, find peril. So he absolutely attributes the, you know, we could analyze it and say the fight or flight instinct, the cortisol, the adrenaline that happens to men in business suits and movie theaters to the campfire. I hope you're seeing that it's a gamut and yes, it evolves, but we still can rely on all that resonance from the repetition of these archetypes. That is a good thing. All right, the next archetype I'd like to discuss is what's called the orphan or regular guy or gal. Obviously <laughs> it's right there in the name, little orphan Annie would be the quintessential example. When you hear Every man or regular, I, I don't love that so much because the every man has been usurped by advertising and political campaigning and propaganda, as you know. So because I have a knee jerk reaction to this every man idea, when I take, uh, you know, when I hear a commercial that says, folks just like you, I think, well, where are these people? I'm 53 years old and I've never met them. So, you know, it's kind of insulting when I hear folks just like you. I also think, well, folks just like middle America are not folks like me. So the bandwagon effect that we, or the bandwagon um, propaganda technique that we talked about last week falls pretty short with me. And then if you look at somebody like Tim Allen, who's made an entire career out of the everyman, I would say Tom Hanks has done the same thing, right? You can look at your, and this is a fun exercise, look at different actors that have hit a stride or become a commodity that have a brand they often fall into one of these archetypes. And I hope this examples click with you. For me, it's just that the Tim Allen, I do think he's likable, but a lot of his conservative values are not mine. So he's every man to middle America, but not to me. 
Uh, okay, so little orphan Annie would be the quintessential orphan. A slightly less annoying example with, without a red fro <clears throat> would be uh, Edith Piaf in La Vie en Rose. This is a beautiful film that's based on real life about torch singer Edith Piaf. And then the later version, the adult version, is played by Marianne Cotillard, if you know her, amazing actress. And then I don't have, unfortunately, Peter Pan, but he is man, the quintessential example. Oliver Twist, Heidi, Cosette from Les Miserables. And then again, I don't have Peter Pan, but I do like Mowgli, so I included him. He's the classic orphan. All right, and then <laughs> while we're going down the Disney road, here are all, if not orphans, they're missing one parent. So the, the top is absent mother, hold on. Yeah. <laughs> no or absent mother would be the first grouping. The second grouping is stepmothers and or mother figures. And then here is the mother was killed, died and or captured. <laughs> so for that reason alone, it's too much to go into, but I do think it's worth talking about very quickly. Again, I ask my students regularly, you know, why do you suppose Disney either relies on that archetype or fell into that trap? Why do you think so many Disney protagonists have a missing parent? Put it in the chat if you have any thoughts. I often hear, well, because it creates sympathy or empathy for your protagonist. So almost like a dog that's been kicked too much, it's a pathetic individual that we've discussed pathos last week that elicits our pathos in the form of sympathy or empathy. I'm not gonna argue, of course, that helps us invest in the want or the need, and we call that the goal of the protagonist, and therefore we transform along with them when the conflict resolves. Uh, that couldn't be a bad thing, but I do think it's more than that. And I suggested earlier that maybe the orphan archetype speaks a little more to this innate understanding of the true nature of the universe on a metaphysical level. I know, I'm not even gonna say I think, I know, and there are many schools of thought that support this, that, and again, the hero's journey, we're gonna get into it in a minute, speaks to this idea that we all feel transplanted, right? We're all disconnected from whatever our source is. And we sort of look around for, we seek. Daddy, a god in the sky with a big flowing beard and a robe, but it is a drive in humanity. So I think the yearning and the longing that's created in these protagonists in the Disney films speaks to that. It's not just the empathy factor, like the dog that's been kicked too much. I hope, hope you would somewhat agree with that, or at least think about it. All right, so the next archetype is the hero archetype. Oh, no, don't do that. And of course, there are many, many versions and subcategories and varieties. But the classic hero, of course, is Achilles in Troy, or any retelling of the Trojan Wars. You have Ulysses in Clash of the Titans, or again, any retelling of the Peloponnesian Wars. You have Cap, oh, those are also from Clash of the Titans. You have Captain Ahab from Moby Dick. I would venture to say he ventures into the subcategory of like, not just a hero, but an adventurer. And that's become, especially during imperialism, when sort of patriarchy reigned, this idea of being a, an adventurer and never settling down and yes, appeasing your intellectual curiosity, but also, you know, maybe shooting, shooting animals and bringing the head home. It was valued. And so you have this Captain Ahab archetype of, of adventure. I might've mentioned last week, a lot of my protagonists are addicted to adventure as a way of avoiding intimacy. So that archetype is alive and well, and you might see it embodied in a real life persona like Ernest Hemingway. <laughs> and he clearly looks like the most interesting man in the world here, doesn't he? So that, there's that subcategory, I believe. And then you have very vaulted heroes. Uh, if any of you have seen Lawrence of Arabia, you would agree he's a pretty dark villain, not, not a redeemable, he, I'm sorry, did I say villain? You've heard of the redeemable villain and the faulted hero. He's beyond a faulted hero, he's pretty twisted if you look at the subtext. But this is one of the films that is regularly mentioned in those books as A, a cinematic masterpiece, and I cannot disagree, um, because it was kind of before its time in its use of 
film language and cinematography. I've been, and I've actually seen a re-release remastered on the big screen. It is very lush visually, but more to the point, like I've been to that part of Petra and it just the way it was almost documentary style, pre gritty documentary where they would just leave the camera rolling and they would catch a little door kind of creaking in the wind and they would use it. They used the local Bedouins as extras and it just has this real almost documentary feel to it at times. And then it lapses into really epic, you know, more cinematic moments. It's fascinating to watch. Okay, the next archetype would be, again, the sage, which you could call it the oracle, the conduit, the voice of wisdom, the conscience, etc. So again, probably goes back to the campfire, but I think we could certainly say that the three faiths of Greek classicism are at, at you know, the forefront of it. Here's the Disney version of the fates, since we're probably mostly animation folks. And these were based on Gerald Scarf's designs. He's gonna come up later. This is a painter called Alma Tadima, who is a pre-Raphaelite, beautiful depiction. If any of you have seen 300, um, this is the Oracle of Delphi. And I did love that film, man. I'm not an action adventure guy, but I saw 300 and it somehow I was like, blood, more blood. It really got to, I was into it. I also jokingly called it um, 300 abs because of all the airbrushed abs. Okay, and then this one is worth spending some time on. So I think we all would agree Jiminy Cricket is uh, Pinocchio's conscience, right? But I want you to consider that the conscience plays a part in a much larger parable about life. Not an allegory so much, but a parable. So again, this one is a little bit lost on my students, but notice in this background how, it's not the best example, but the edges are kind of dark and vignetted. If you look at Princess and the Frog, it 100% went back to this tradition of vignetting the edges of the frame, usually darker, and then what's called trapping the lights using um, a, spot, uh, a spot of light. In this case, it was 100% relevant. The art direction reflected the thematic content. It wasn't random. And next week, when we get into the nuts and bolts, we are gonna talk about how all this theoretical stuff from these past three weeks becomes your art direction in a very practical way. So consider this idea, hmm, why is this convention of vignetting the edges so prevalent in this film? Well, sure. It, harkens back to Arthur Rackham and the turn of the century children's book illustrators. There are many reasons, but on a thematic level, hopefully on further analysis, you would agree it is a parable. Pinocchio is all of us. Geppetto is God or the puppet master. And we're going to um, go to the creator God archetype in just a moment. And this journey of becoming a real boy, quote unquote, is the journey of developing character. You know, you've probably heard earning your wings, a number of other ways of saying it. But even when he goes to that island and is tempted by corruption, it's all part of the yellow brick road journey towards becoming a real boy. That's symbolic for redeeming oneself by building character. So Jiminy Cricket, the ultimate conscience, as is the Holy Spirit in Christianity. Same archetype. It's that angel on your shoulder, right? That is sort of a conduit for the message. All right, and now we're getting the usual suspects. <laughs> Gandalf and his um, doppelganger. Is it white, white Gandalf? And then the Star Wars franchise, I could have picked Ben Kenobi, but I, I picked this guy instead. I could have done worse, I guess. And then this one cracks me up because they didn't even change up the word. Like, could it slap you in the face anymore? This is the Oracle from the Matrix. And I did like it, I'm not bashing it, by the way. And then I think this is Mr. Miyagi from um, The Karate Kid. So now with this slide, it might be a good time to talk about stereotypes. I would ask you how many sages, you know, Eastern Asian sages can you think of in film and how insulting is it? <laughs> Um, if any of you have seen Breakfast at Tiffany's, there's a really, in today's climate, a really hard to watch sequence of Mickey Rooney 
playing a very similar character to Miyagi. But the point is, I believe everything is on some gamut from archetype to stereotype to cliche. Tina, I would love it if you could field some chat uh, fodder on this front, but I would ask you, where is your line? Meaning, where do you draw the line? When does something lapse from archetypal universal stereo, uh, sorry, archetypal resonance to stereotype or even cliche? What determines, right? What seems like a good thing, archetypal resonance versus stereotype or cliche? I'm gonna give you my answer in just a moment. Or Tina, if anything good comes up, let me know. Well, somebody already started. Aaron said misappropriation. Thank you, yep. What else? Uh, we're Cultural. waiting, waiting for more voices. <laughs> okay, okay. I love that you said that, it's, it's on my list for sure. Okay, I'll start mine, Tina, and if anything else comes up, let me know. Um, well, my, yeah. my opinion and you know, schools of thought that are out there, that which is not, you know, that which is culturally relative will not be universal, right? So we've talked about Aladdin, how the woo, 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 the Arsenio Hall reference that just kind of evolved with uh, Robin Williams' improvising did not stand the test of time. It's not probably going to become a Disney classic for that reason alone. Many, many very timely cultural references. In the same way, if it's too culturally relative, it's not going to be universal globally. So think about that. You know, if it's too tied into a time and place, um, then it's maybe not going to be universal. More to the point, Tina, originality came up, if you remember, and this idea that a lot of things are derivative and there's a lot of mimicry going on uh, other than franchises with a toy attached. That's the only thing big studios are throwing money at these days or sort of the Disney, you know, the remakes of the Disney films that we worked on. So sort of banking on the nostalgia of now grown up little girls with a wallet. There's a million great scripts circulating around Hollywood and yet the less original, more derivative fare is what studios are throwing money at. So to connect it all, my opinion, and I guess I'm preaching, is that if your work is true, and I want this to land, so let's slow down. Don't worry about the chat for now. If your work is truly inspired, and we've talked a lot about inspiration and what that looks like, I've gently suggested inspiration comes from collective consciousness. Inspiration comes from the universe. So it makes sense that if you honor it, it's going to be universal. We've also spoken a lot about drawing on life experience when you write or every stroke you put down, every word you type. If it draws on personal human experience during your lifetime, it's going to have the ring of authenticity, but it also just might be more universal and more archetypal. Have you ever heard the phrase, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. It's the same with this authenticity versus mimicry conversation. If you don't nurture the inner realm and have worldviews and thoughts and opinions about life, then of course you're gonna lapse into mimicry and do derivative work or even reductive work. I hope that lands. So it's always inspiration that saves you from that trap. So there's were three things. Oh, and the cultural misappropriation idea. Absolutely. If, so that does speak to like, if you don't have any business writing about it, don't do it. Or don't get somebody in blackface to play the part, <laughs> right? So I, 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 real quickly, I, as a live action film director, casting is one of my favorite parts of the process. I do love working with the composer, as I said last week, but I just love casting because I'm in awe of a great actor and I love meeting them. And, Usually the casting director chats them up and it's just a pleasure. But one casting director that I hired, for no reason at all, they make sure, I mean, for very good reason, but no ostensible reason, they make sure to keep diversity and inclusion at the forefront of their process. So I would write characters that maybe not the main protagonist, well, even those, I, I don't really think about race personally, so it doesn't matter usually what the race is. And so I just love that for no reason at all, you see every ethnicity walk in the door during auditions and that is a credit to the casting directors. So yes, cultural misappropriation. Anyway, what was the other response you were gonna share? Tina? Yeah, Krister said, it's 
expecting the audience's preconceived notions to do the work of the script. Wow, expecting, see, hmm. Well, I don't know, what do you get from that, Tina? I wonder if there's more, because I, I think you're relying on the resonance of archetypes and that is a beautiful thing to me. Um, if a script is well-written, I don't know. I mean, I like when you, the, it's interactive. As a viewer, you connect dots consciously or subconsciously and it's not spoon fed, but I wonder what is meant by that. Tina, do you have a take on that? I don't, unless it just means it's pulling too hard at you. Like, so, like preachy or didnactic. Or, yeah. Maybe. Maybe Krista yeah. can uh, give us some explanation, yeah, but Ruben also has one. Ruben says exaggeration to make a point but maybe not being thoughtful of how that can come across. <laughs> yeah, sensitivity, right? Yeah, sensitivity right, you hit over the head. <laughs> right. Well, I wonder why they might exact, I mean, I don't know. It's a certain, right, a certain mindset. Somebody would exaggerate a stereotype to make a point. Well, if they had biases, right? And if that was part of their agenda. There are filmmakers who want to habituate people to violence. I don't, I don't see it, but I'm sure there are. There are filmmakers who might be out to reinforce stereotypes. Maybe Donald Trump is a film, filmmaker and we just don't know it. Who knows? But yeah, you know it when you see it, it's insensitive, I, I agree. Yeah, Krister explained, it's a little nuanced because I believe the writing should work with the audience's expectations. Right, I, I think we, last week we talked a little bit about cultural relativity and somebody did ask in the chat, well, how do you make something to speak, speak to audiences? I offered my opinion just from my experience of having written several novels and made several films. You don't want to please all the people all the time, right? So you know your readership, you know your audience. So I will write a, an entire novel that's a little elitist. It's not meant for everyone. It's meant for people that are like-minded, I hate to say it, but have a similar worldview. I know my readership. If I want something to be more mainstream, I have to really put thought into what's gonna be, again, be universal or culturally relative. I do think that is largely what it is to be a writer, but probably to be a storyteller as well. Whether it's visual storytelling or the written word, you become a master at knowing what's universal. This is why we're talking about the universal archetypes. And you become a master of knowing what's culturally relative. I've suggested too, as a storyteller, you become a, not master, but you strive to master knowing what's gonna land cerebrally, viscerally, and emotionally. And you hit them in a calculated way, but hopefully subconsciously because it's second nature. I think, yeah, we're on the same page there, but I thought the first suggestion was that sort of relying on the audience's reactions, I don't wanna put words in his mouth, or but, relying on them without the script doing its work. So I don't know, maybe a great writer just knows what's universal and does rely on the connecting of dots without spoon feeding. I hate uh, when all the dots are connected and you feel beaten up by the time you get out of the theater. I think we're agreeing, I don't know. Thank you so much for answering those. Yeah, do you have any thoughts, Tina, on that? Uh, some, no, I don't, but somebody mm -hmm. else said, what about using a stereotype for shorthand? probably happens all the time. Lazy, right? Lazy writing. Well, I also think, I mean, at Disney, Tina, you probably surely noticed the visual development artist is, of course, really stunning. And I call it lateral exploration. We might try stylistically quite a diverse approach, but also um, the voice is stronger. So voice and style are a little bit different, but the voices and styles are probably more diverse and the blue sky stages of visual development. We all know it's a little more on brand by the time it hits the screen. There are many reasons for that, right? There's stockholders to please and the brand, like in Hercules, when Meg's nose was too angular and pointed, the public did freak out. There were drop shadows and core shadows for a long time in our animated films, but on Pocahontas, when we went back to flat posterized like Sleeping Beauty, without relying on the dimension of form shadows, we call them tones in animation, and drop shadows the public noticed and freaked out. So there's a brand to uphold in their stockholders. But more than that, what I'm offering is no matter how progressive the goal is at a well-oiled machine like Disney with a production pipeline, within the trenches, because time is money, it's not TV animation, it's a little slower, 
but you still have a production schedule and a release date and a budget. So within the trenches, I call it, within the background department, within the layout department, within the cleanup department, you do have individuals falling back on convention because it's familiar and it gets the job done on time. You know, so anything could water down a vision, but maybe too, I guess we called it laziness to just do a quick fix that ends up being stereotypical, but it could happen, do you know what I mean? Because of in, in, individuals in the equation have their own biases. I like to think at Disney, we had our finger on the pulse and there was a collective, not collective unconscious, but a collective consciousness among the artists that made for one kind of storytelling, which is directing by committee. It was a beautiful thing. It's a little different than a singular vision, right? From a singer songwriter or one individual with something to say. Wonderful, thank you. I'm just taking opportunities, Tina, to fill in gaps because I do think this is all related here. Thank you for uh, the participation. Okay, the next, uh, we're almost done with these because we can't get to all the character archetypes, but the ones I chose, I think this is the second to the last. So this is the God archetype, which can be thought of as the creator archetype, or you sometimes hear the architect, um, the inventor, all the you know, variations on the same thing. And uh, hold on. So obviously in the Wizard of Oz, we, we kind of analyzed that one to death last week. And this would be the sort of disillusioning God or the abandoning God or the, <laughs> the disappointing God. Uh, Dorothy had to learn she had the goods within without relying on external validation or answers. So he really is God in L. Frank Baum's original series and probably any uh, interpretation of it. I love how nuanced this performance was because it's kind of a combination of the trickster archetype and the inventor god creator archetype. This would be Daedalus from the Icarus myth, who is the quintessential inventor archetype, uh, but also he's been called an architect. And I don't know why the, <laughs> he looks so old. And I always think, well, how does he have a teenage son if he's got one foot in the grave? But he, clearly he's not old in this one, but usually he's, he looks like that. All right, and then pretty much every role Jeff Goldblum has ever played falls into the mad scientist version of this. You sometimes have the bumbling scientist or the absent-minded professor. So this speaks to what we said earlier. If, if um, Tom Hanks has made a career out of playing the everyman, <laughs> Jeff Goldblum has, has sort of padded his bank account by being that, you know, I don't know, eccentric, professor architect. And this, of course, is, I think, Malcolm from uh, Jurassic Park. Is that his name? OK. I've gotten off my, OK. And then, of course, this is Christopher Lloyd as Doc Brown from Back to the Future. Did we talk about stereotypes? OK, so now if you've kind of gotten a sense of character archetypes. Those absolutely will inform even visual development work, character design, but there are also underlying story archetypes. We mentioned innate responses to formal properties a moment ago, as in red, triangle, circle, black, design elements, right? Ingredients in your design suit. I put, that's three categories. We're going to get into the latter one a little bit later and then of course, next week is devoted to that. But I think it's worth quickly going over the underlying story archetypes. You have overcoming the monster. And that one, I want to just suggest, if you think of it as overcoming the demon, that might click a little bit more. We all have demons. That's a word that's been used to describe doubt, fear, shame, guilt, apprehension. If you look at a Miyazaki film, meek to empowered tends to be the hero's journey and that or the transformative arc in that one. But we all have demons. Something as seemingly benign as doubt is by definition a demon that one overcomes. So overcoming the monster might mean an antagonistic force that's not put in a body with a twisty mustache. It could just be a force. So if you think of it as overcoming the monster, you might think of the Kraken or Godzilla or Frankenstein. But if you think of it figuratively, like fear, doubt, 
I love this example, which is if you ever saw Beowulf, it's the sins of the father in this case that came back to roost. It's the manifestation, the embodiment, the incarnation of a pretty horrible concept, sins of the father. I think it was very disturbing. Um, I, I resisted it, just a little personal opinion. You know, it was back when Polar Express had just come out and the mocap technology just wasn't quite there yet. So Polar Express and this one were both kind of known for the dead eye thing. And I resisted it because I thought, why do we need to just show off the technology when it's not even there yet? There was this competition to keep up with the Joneses and show off the latest greatest, but why if, if they're all gonna have dead eyes? So I was really ready to resent it. And then I effing loved it because the disturbing quality created by this sort of stiff animation with no squash and stretch or anticipation in action, the dead eyes because of the limitations of mocap actually created quite a surreal tone that suited the story in my opinion. So this one is one of, I believe, correct me someone out there if I'm wrong, but I believe it's been uh, sort of framed as the first writing, it's in poetic form, not prose form, in English, uh, early English, not early modern, but early English. So it's profound and it has really stood the test of time. That's Beowulf and that's Grendel. All right, that is all of our archetypes. Re with regard to the archetypal story templates, this is really just review and sadly I don't have a slide for it, but we're almost to the finish line here. I wanna recap and they're not the Shakespearean archetypes. These have been attributed to Young. You will see parallels with the Shakespearean story templates we talked about last week. But Rags to Riches is one. I suggested that Pygmalion, which became My Fair Lady, which arguably became Pretty Woman, falls into that template. You have The Quest, which is uh, my book, The Seeker, by the way. And all those vagabond characters I mentioned that might be fleeing intimacy because they're addicted to adventure. You have Voyage and Return, and that's Homer's Iliad and Odyssey. Uh, I do put in that category this through the rabbit hole idea. So, you know, C.S. Lewis's works, um, Indian in the Cupboard, uh, Bridge to Terabithia, a lot of middle grade or young adult fiction has to do with this through the rabbit hole. Thing. Alice in Wonderland would be the prime example where you go through a portal, you usually meet a sage, uh, you return to the real world having learned or gained something in the introspective journey, which the rabbit hole is symbolic for, or a rabbit hole to the actual metaphysical level of existence, despite the matrix, the appearance. Um, so then you return to everyday life with the knowledge or wisdom that's meant to redeem humanity or simply give you coping skills in life. That's voyage and return. Then you have a comedy in which, as we defined it, a want or a need, a higher need is met or a tragedy which neither the want nor the need are met, in which case it becomes a cautionary tale. And then you have rebirth, the tree and the snake brought up, right? Rebirth for a lot of people. They seemed to symbolize that on a conceptual level. So all the return to innocence stories are about rebirth. Okay, I think that's enough, Tina. I'm gonna give a real quick uh, glimpse of next week, flipping through these next slides. Hopefully get you excited about that. And then we're gonna assign, if you can remind me, assign a little exercise that I hope people will participate in. Awesome. So hopefully we're, sorry, sound good? Yep, sounds great. <laughs> sorry, there's a little delay with the Zoom. Anyway, hopefully you recognize this from Mulan. So again, next week will be largely about, okay, all this theoretical stuff to do with story does that really inform the visuals? I'm here to say it does. So I think one thing that's important to know in feature anyway, is story development and visual development are neck and neck. They're happening simultaneously. So in the same way, a storyboard artist might plus the script. So does visual development and the artwork. In other words, there is no screenplay in animation. It's actually leaning that way. They're using more and more screenplay format. But traditionally, there's just what's called a treatment. 
And you can go online and look at the original Lion King treatment. It's in prose format. It's not formatted as a screenplay. And it evolved, right? Because animation is a medium that lends itself to departing from reality. You're not limited to storyboarding based on an existing location. We haven't really nailed or finalized the character design. So the world is your oyster, if that makes sense. So in the same way, let's say the treatment has a line of dialogue. That might inspire in the boarding a little bit of what I call a sight gag or some kind of business or blocking, something to supplement the dialogue. Then that might in turn inspire a new line from the writers. In the same way, visual development absolutely informs the story development. So two separate departments, visual development and story development. They are neck and neck. Okay, so the way that art direction evolves and by the time you get to those 18 months of production, hopefully you have a style guide. The Mulan one, by the way, and I, I'll show you next week. I just didn't grab it. I can physically show you. It was really comprehensive, but it was almost comical because it had X's. Do this, don't do that. Do this, don't do that. Meaning, you know, little things like rhythm. How do we use rhythm? Well, we punctuate tiles on a roof like this, but not like that. There was a huge concept of yin and yang that was meant to be incorporated in every layout, every composition, the value structure, the color, etc. So if you think about it, Mulan was one of the most well-loved tales in China. So we, I think Disney wanted to honor that and not screw it up, right? <laughs> it's a big country with a lot of people that could be disappointed. So of course, it was logical to look at, you know, Chinese woodblock prints, traditional watercolors, all of that. But they also, on a philosophical conceptual level, wanted to incorporate the idea of yin and yang. So again, not 50-50 because that's static and there is no dendrite movement or really a visual um, stimulation, but balance with rhythm. And that is the ultimate, if you look at the yin yang, uh, with movement, I'm sorry, that's the ultimate. So again, it's not a 50-50 positive and negative space. It's not 50-50 active area versus simple area, but it's a consciousness of the interplay between the two, hopefully with movement. So just look for that in the next couple slides. You're going to see the Hun attack. And it is beautiful in its poetic simplicity, I call it, because you might have 90% of the screen displaced by just white snow. That's called inactive area. That's called negative space. But it is the um, stage through which those Huns are going to attack. Also notice that it's pretty similar to the wildebeest stampede. <clears throat> and that has to do with deep canvas. I just think it's one of the most cohesively art directed films ever and really beautifully done, very poetic. So look for the yin yang, the consciousness of positive and negative space. The polarity. All right, and then quickly, this is Gerald Scarf. You actually saw his work in that opening montage. If you saw the hammers making their way across the field, and that was Pink Floyd the Wall from my teenage years. And then all these years later, he was brought on to have a very strong influence on Hercules. Some of his designs, the way they came off his pen, made it to the screen without much watering down. love his work. So real quick, just notice, you know, the spirals in um, Hercules's outfit. There's a difference between including a motif where it might logically occur. Look at his breastplate. Okay, if that's a variation on the Greek key, that swirl, I will venture to say the swirl is also the introspective journey and it is always equated with folklore, folktales, myths, and legends. But it is reminiscent of the Greek key. But what I try to get my students to do in my classes is use the motifs conceptually, not literally, conceptually. And we'll get into this more next week. But don't put it where it would logically occur. Just infuse it, right, as a motif to create a convincing universe that consciously or subconsciously, we may not even notice the motifs, but they do create a cohesiveness and a consistency to the convincing universe we're trying to create. And that's why you, you see the Greek key translated as a spiral where it wouldn't logically occur. His kneecaps, his elbows, his chin. You see the difference? On the breastplate, it might logically occur there. 
people in my classes sometimes put like the Minoan wave motif, they'll put it on pottery and think, wow, I created a really cool stylistic approach. And I think, well, no, that's what a pot would have. I'm not that mean about it. That's what a pot would have in Crete. I try to gently nudge people to use motifs conceptually. And that is probably the best example I can think of of the two different approaches. Look at his elbows, look at his chin, and then the breastplate. All right, and then really just everywhere. This is, I think, a production background or a color key, not sure which, by Tom Cardone, who was the background supervisor. Beautiful backgrounds. Spirals everywhere. Look at those trees. Somebody vomited spirals. No, I think it's really beautifully done. All right, and I think that's enough. There's a couple of questions. Aaron says, can archetypes exist in non-narrative or non-representational film or animation? Of course. I mean, yes. I mean, we're not, see, we're focusing on storytelling and I am catering a little bit to the animation community, but I included fine art for a reason, right? And I would argue any, and we can't even define art or beauty yet, but I, you know, what is art? A whole conversation there. Um, there's conceptual, I kind of did want to go into this this week, right? There's figural representational art, and then there's conceptual art. So this idea of linear or nonlinear, abstract, or figurative, figural, doesn't matter. I mean, there's a reason I chose images or sequences from films in that first montage that were not dialogue heavy. There was a tiny bit of dialogue in um, Pan's Labyrinth by Guillermo del Toro. But I chose for reasons. So experimental films, nonlinear storytelling, usually for whatever reason, foreign films or indie films, art art house films, tend to be more conceptual and less linear in their narrative. So I think they're more reliant on archetypes. One example I'll give is my film, The Passerby. I intentionally made the protagonist. She's not the protagonist the ant character, a very integral character, one of the primary characters. I made her symbolically mute. She just didn't speak. There was a language barrier, but more importantly, I just didn't want her to have a voice in her current circumstances. So she just never spoke. There's plenty of dialogue in the film. It was not dialogue heavy. They say a page per minute and a film like Beau Travai, which I would recommend, it's a 90 minute film, but the script is literally like 20 pages because it's all imagery that transports you. Those are my favorite films personally. I Am Not Afraid is another one I would recommend. It's all, it just transports you because of the beautiful cinematography. Script is probably that fat. So anyway, for whatever reason, I wanted to make Elena, Maria Elena, mute. My actress that I ended up casting intuitively I later learned was a theater dell'arte trained actress. Theater dell'arte is all about gestures and facial expressions. It's not about the words. The tears she pulled could not have been more visceral and loaded with life experience. So I hope that's related to the question. I think it's more reliant on archetypes when you get those annoying words out of the equation. That's when you get to the core, right? This whole workshop is called uh, story and image, the language of the soul. I suggested at the outset that pre-language we dreamt in imagery. That's why it rings so resonant and so deep. Words are inefficient to approximate anything about the human experience, in my opinion. Um, somebody mentioned about Hercules. They said, I thought they also used some inspiration from the pillars the Greek pillars. Oh, I'm sure there's probably yeah. the vases, the pillars, the, uh, yeah, I think, well, and that's kind of, again, we don't have too much time here, but in my visual development class, of course, you're going to research the design motifs of the culture you're representing. And that, it, there's a lot to dig into, right? There's the Corinthian columns and there's all kinds of columns. There's kind of um, uh, amphoras, they're called, and vases and urns. There's all kinds of pottery that you could look at. There are frescoes in mosaic, I forget what they called them in Greece, but the equivalent of a fresco. 
all kinds of things to draw on. And you were going to do that to be, to honor the culture, right? And uh, Mulan, very reliant on research. You know, what does a Zen garden look like? What does a shrine look like? What do those watercolors and the woodblock prints look like? What does the calligraphic stroke look like? But it, that's just the beginning. So I do try to encourage my students to do the research for authenticity purposes. And again, to avoid that cultural misappropriation, but then use it conceptually, not literally. And I think I explained, you know, on rewinding, it might make more sense, but I think I explained that as best I could. You use it, how about this, in an inventive way where the motif might not logically occur. The best example, again, is take the Greek key. Sure, put it on pottery, put it on a fresco as a border, put it on a chair rail. But those are all places where it would logically be. Now let's use it inventively or conceptually and just put it in a chin or an elbow or a knee for no good reason at all or a tree. You saw the Greek key in trees and clouds and everywhere else in those examples. Wonderful. Do you have a favorite animated film that uh, executes that where the design is pushing the story very well in that regard? I know Hercules is pretty strong. Yeah, I mean, again, next week, I, I do, in my classes, I generally say, look, I'm not pushing a Disney look by any means for this thing from it. And we play experimental films, we all bring them in. I bring in my favorites, the students do. But I do talk about the Disney examples because I was there and I own the style guides. And, you know, there's a whole trunk full of stuff that I can bring in. I'm not going to scan it all for this workshop, but, you know, because it's, it's easy for me to talk about. So I don't have a favorite that's coming to mind, but I can absolutely talk about the Disney examples because they're really well thought out. Um, I do prefer other brands, I prefer. I do like other brands. I do like nonlinear and experimental things as much or more than the slick commercial mainstream product that is Disney. Uh, maybe next week I'll be sure to include more of those examples. Today in the montage, you saw, I can't think of his name, but the Sandman uh, was in there. That's really experimental, really stylized, really well done, really well thought out. There was a beautiful film called uh, Lost, The Lost Thing. That was the one you might've seen the very surreal, uh, almost half animal, half uh, robots. That was called The Lost Thing. So yeah. I think there's a million examples. I can't think of a favorite. I'm so sorry. Do you guys have favorites? What's your favorite in terms of how the story informs the art direction? Somebody said that... The Rise of the Guardians. Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't know that one too well. I will say, because again, I'm a product of Disney, but I don't love, it's not, it's just the beginning. But of the Disney films, I've heard myself say, of course, Sleeping Beauty was the most cohesively art direction. Oh, and right. he, oh my God, it doesn't get any better. I mean, Ivan Earl personally trained right. everybody to adapt his style. But I would also say that art direction was based on this process we're talking about. The logical thing to research would be those medieval tapestries, 100% the approach of Ivan Earl's backgrounds, the tapestries, right? The um, stacked perspective, the intentional flatness. So they harken back to stained glass windows and tapestries, if that makes sense. And I, they were both. They were log like if you entered Sleeping Beauty's cast castle, Sleeping Beauty's castle, you saw tapestries everywhere and banners hanging that were based on research. They were logical. But you also saw stacked perspective used in a figurative or non-literal or inventive way, which is, I won't be able to say it any clearer next week we'll go into it more but you know what i mean the research resulted in inventive ways of using stained glass windows stacked perspective tapestries but it also occurred where it logically would in that time period and culture so yeah sleeping beauty is cohesively art directed mulan right was the other one that sometimes they're all over the place no offense to anyone but we lost our art director the week before going into uh, Lion King, be week before going into production. It's a small miracle. It did as well as it could did. And that's testament to the fact that it's story that matters. 
So we cobbled together the art direction as we went. I mean, especially as a background department, we keyed backgrounds as they came across our desk. And it was largely naturalistic. Andy, and when Andy jumped on, he very much said, you know what, story-driven, story-driven art direction. So in a way that was quite literal. If it's noon, let's make it broad daylight. If it's evening, let's make it evening. The genius of Andy is that he decided when we sort of transform into a sort of different frame of mind, that's where we stylize highly and we depart from reality. So if you look at um, Just Can't Wait to Be King, it's based on, yeah, children's picture book uh, tradition, but also regional folk art from Africa. Genius, because he let Chris Sanders run with that. It's a little film in itself. Look at um, Scar's song, same thing. Constructivism, propaganda posters, Nazi propaganda. Um, that is a little gem of art direction in and of itself. So think about it. It's fairly naturalistic, except for highly stylized scenes like that. Hakuna Matata was highly art directed as a sequence and highly stylized, not naturalistic. I don't know what they were thinking on that one. I painted some of them and I thought the colors were quite garish. Do you know what the art direction thought was on Hakuna Matata? I do not. Uh, we need to ask Andy, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I don't know. They never I don't couldn't. know. <laughs> um, we're getting close to the end. And one other comment here was someone mentioned a film, Marcel Jankovic's Tragedy of Man. Not Is sure. it anime or live action? Uh, that, I don't know. Awesome, yeah. Oh, he said animated. Yeah, I'll check it out. Since we're wrapping it up, Tina, yes. I do feel compelled. It is something I had wanted to say that I didn't fit in, but it is the perfect moment to say it. Disney, I just feel blessed and spoiled. It was a well-oiled machine. I've seen all kinds of cultures since, and none of them have had, A, the respect for artists and what we do, the built-in protections for artists, the logical pipeline, you know, there's been some chaos. But the biggest thing that baffles me, Disney was sure once we had a sequence that was greenlit, you had regular screenings, right? So that A, the crew can be excited about it, and B, they can know the effing story they're telling. So at some point, yeah, if it's still in the works, it is dirty laundry. You can erode faith and you can erode morale by showing dirty laundry. I get that. But within reason, I just love that Disney brought us into the theater and showed us dailies, showed us, um, you know, the reels that had been greenlit for production regularly. I have been on jobs as a visual development artist on, let's say, a CG feature at a smaller studio. Sometimes you have gaming studios that are trying to get in the game or, you know, do their first animated feature. and. They don't necessarily have a slick pipeline like Disney, quite the opposite. But I've been on some of those jobs for a week and said, can I please see the animatic? Like, <laughs> how, can I, how can I pluck a storyboard drawing to do a story beat that's called or a moment painting when I don't know the larger story? So I would say, hopefully by now you see the importance of understanding the ins and outs of the story in order to bring it to life but sometimes you just have to ask for it. I always ask for the animatic, whatever's been approved, tell me where it is on the server, I will find it. And you spend the time to watch it. 